Hebrews chapter number 3. This morning we're going to look at the partnering touch of the Master. The partnering touch. We have one verse we're going to start with this morning. We deal with this thought of the partnering touch. We've seen the Master's touch has been a life-giving touch, a victorious touch, an illuminating touch. And This morning we're going to focus on a, a being a partnering touch. Hebrews chapter number 3. Look with me at verse number 14. We find these words. For we, he's addressing here the Christians, particularly here the Jewish Christians, but today us Christians, those who accept Christ as Savior, for we are made partakers of Christ. Notice, we are made partakers of Christ. The word partakers is the word partner, as the idea of sharing as the idea of participating, we're partners together with Christ. When you and I accepted Christ as Savior, we were made partakers or partners of Christ. This morning we're going to focus on that, and hopefully this morning uh, it'll encourage this morning that if you're saved by the grace of God, you are a partner with Christ. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today thanking you once again for your blessings. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning to Lord, open your word, or to examine this wonderful thought of how you have made us partners with you. Lord, I pray this morning that you would have your will and your way, that in this time, Lord, I pray that you would give me clarity of thought, me clarity of speech, and Lord, I pray, Lord, today, if there's one that does not know you as Savior, that Lord, today, the Holy Spirit of God would convict their hearts, they would see their need, and turn to you. We love you today, we give you praise, not and glory, for you're worthy of it all. In Jesus' name we ask it, amen. Well, this morning, we're going to talk about the partnering touch of the Master. As we talk about the partnering touch, I'm going to get some help this morning. I'm going to ask Brother Buddy. Come here and help me just for a moment. We're going to talk about being a partner real quick. Now, as Buddy's coming, of course, uh, he's attended here, church here for a number of years, and uh, he's going to, I put him on the spot this morning, so I'm not sure if he's nervous or not. I'm going to make him really nervous. I'm going to give him a microphone so everybody can hear him on Facebook Live. Facebook Live needs to hear you, man. You are, you are live streamed this morning. I hear you. So, now, now Buddy. You are self-employed, am I correct? Yes, sir. What do you do for a living? Pour concrete. You pour concrete for a living. You've got your own business pouring concrete. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, this morning I have a proposition for you. All right. What All is right. It? I want to be your partner. But before you answer, before you answer, let me tell you, every, I, I know about concrete. I know everything there is to know about concrete. Because you poured the concrete at my house, right? Yes, sir. I watched you. I know how to do it. I got you. You go out there and you, you, you lay off the lines. You just stream. You don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it was easy. I watched it the whole time. Yes, sir. And, and you dig that little trench all the way around, and then you put concrete in there. You put some rebar in there. And, and then, of course, you've got you to work with the plumbers, too. Oh, yeah. You've got to work with the plumbers, let them get in there, do their thing, and then you, you put the, the bricks up, and you make sure you get the dirt in there, and then the concrete. I, I've been watching you do my driveway. Yes, sir. And once you got all stuff done, you know, you've got you, you to you do that little brushing thing to smooth it out, you know. <laughs> And then it's, it's simple. It's real simple. You got the little truck, you make the little lines in it, so it won't make hopes so it won't crack and stuff. So I know a lot about concrete. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah, I know a lot about concrete. So <laughs> I got a proposition for you. Now, All right, now so you got your business. Yes, sir. How long have you been pouring concrete? I've uh, been in the business for myself for forty years. Forty years. So forty years you got a good reputation in the area. Yes, sir. People call you because they need driveways. Yes, not, sir. You work with contractors, yes, do with the, the Lord foundation and stuff. Yes, sir. Okay. So you got a good reputation, you got, you got good business going for yourself and uh, that's great. Mm-hmm. I know a lot about concrete. I just told you everything yeah, I know yeah, about concrete. I hear that. Mm-hmm. See? So I got a, I got a proposition. I wonder where he was when I was doing his house. He wasn't helping me. <laughs> <laughs> whoa, whoa, time out, time out. No, no. Don't you remember? I was there holding the stick, remember? Leaning on the shovel. No, no. I was down in the, in the trench where I was holding the stick so you could make sure it was at the right depth and everything. Remember that? Uh, it's been a lot of jobs since then. Oh, okay, so I okay. Forgot. I, I, did, I held that little stick because it made sure it was level. Okay, all right. So I, I was there once. <laughs> but listen, I want to be your partner, 50-50 partner. Uh, you do the work, and we'll split it 50-50. That sounds like a good deal for you. Uh, but uh, I don't know, you know, uh, I didn't think about that, but I got a lot of years invested in this, and, you know, and uh, I don't know whether it would be real fair for me and my wife to let somebody come in like that. Uh, so uh, you don't think it's a good deal for you? Uh, probably not. Probably not. Probably not. Because you know, I like it. 
even though I know, uh, even though I got all this wealth of knowledge about concrete. Uh, <laughs> I'll let you have a seat. <laughs> yeah. No, I thank you, but I appreciate that. But I hope I made a point this morning. No, if I wanted to go to buddies, I just went to it this morning. I want to be your partner, 50-50 partner. Does that make any sense for Buddy, for me to be his partner? No. What would I offer Buddy? What do I bring to the table? We're going to pray and go home. No, Buddy's up here. He's got all this time, 40 plus years. He's got this reputation. He's got all these things that he has invested. He's done a lot of work to get to where he is. What sense does it make for him to bring me on as a partner when you know, when I know, I ain't got a clue about concrete, except it dries hard. <laughs> what do you know about concrete? Most of you know about what I told you right then, don't you? It makes no sense at all for, for Buddy to say, yeah, come on, be my partner. I have nothing to bring to the table. What about our verse this morning? We are made partners of Christ. What do you and I bring to the table that would benefit Christ? Absolutely nothing. But when we accept Christ as Savior, He made us partners. We beca- he, listen, we were promoted to being partners in the family business. Even though we have no business, don't know what's going on. He's done it all. He's done all the work. He's got all the power. He's got all the influence. He's got all the knowledge. But he's made you and me a partner anyway. That will just blow our minds. He's made us partners with him. We are partakers of Christ. We are partners with him. Now, as we think about that wonderful thought, let's ask this probing question. It's a question that really... Buddy kind of answered for us in a very nice way. You know, if he were to take me on as a partner, would I be an asset or a liability? Thanks. I feel the love this morning. <laughs> but let's ask ourselves the question in a spiritual sense. We are partners with Christ. Are we an asset or a liability? Whether you want to be a partner or not, whether you deserve to be one or not, because none of us deserve it, we are partners with him. Let's just want to focus on this wonderful fact that we are partakers, but in focusing on that wonderful fact, make sure that we're doing all we can to be a, an asset rather than a liability in the family business. This morning, as we look at this passage of Scripture, we're going to look at this word partakers, and it's actually the, the Greek word used here for partakers is only found once in the book of Luke, and then several times in the book of Hebrews. Uh, the only place that's found in Scripture. So we're going to focus on the book of Hebrews, and we'll flip to Luke in a few, a few minutes. Let's look at this idea of partakers. What does it mean we're partakers or partners with Christ? Well, if you've got your Bibles there, look back up to chapter 3, verse number 1. We read verse 14. But verse number 1 says this, Wherefore, holy brethren, here it is, partakers, we're going to get that word partners, participants, those that share in the heavenly calling. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ, who is faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Notice in verse 1, we are partakers of the heavenly calling. This morning we're going to look at four thoughts concerning being a partner of Christ. Four thoughts concerning part, the partnering touch of Christ. The first thought it's found in verse 1 of chapter 3. Notice we are partners of the heavenly calling. Partners of the heavenly calling. Now, let's remember, we are looking at the book of Hebrews. Deep question this morning. Who is the book of Hebrews written to? The Hebrews. That was real deep, wasn't it? Okay. It's written to Hebrew Christians. Now, What's another word for Hebrews today? Jews, the Jewish, okay? Jewish people. So it's written to the Jewish people, the Hebrews. He's writing to these group of individuals who are Hebrews. 
He's writing particularly to those that are saved, those that are saved thinking about going back to Judaism, those that they've just been playing the game. They're not really saved. They're just, they were going along with the program until things are starting to get tough. And they want to go. So he's writing to this group of Hebrews, but thinking of three categories of people. Notice as we think about that, he addresses here in verse number three, these Jews that are saved, he calls them holy brethren. We, I believe Paul's the author here. He's a penman. So he's writing to them, brother, hey, I'm a Jew. You're a Jew. We're brethren. But we're now holy brethren. Because we're not just Jews together. We're now saved by the grace of God. We're children of God. Listen, he says, we are partners of the heavenly calling. The heavenly calling. You understand that the Jews had a former calling? Okay? Picture in your mind, he's writing here to Jews who have been, who have been saved by the grace of God. They've accepted Christ as Savior. He says, I want to remind you, holy brethren, you've accepted Christ as your Savior, that we have now not an earthly calling anymore, but a heavenly calling. A heavenly calling. So if you think about this heavenly calling, I want to remind you, first of all, of the former Callings. He's addressing the Jews, their former calling. The Hebrews had been partakers of an earthly calling. Remember way back in the book of Genesis? In fact, you can turn there in your Bible if you like. Genesis chapter number 12 is where you'll find it. We find Abraham. We find the calling of God on Abraham's life, on the Jewish people. There's a former calling. All the promises of the Old Testament relating to the tribe, to the nation of Israel were earthly callings. They were earthly blessings. Notice Genesis chapter number 12, God speaking to Abraham here. He says, Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Notice the first earthly calling was to a Land, earthly. He says, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee, and of thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Notice this former calling of the Jews, of the Hebrews. There was a land that was supposed to be theirs. There was an inheritance that they were supposed to have to pass on from generation to generation. We also know that with Abraham here, there's the promise of a physical descendant. As you can know your Bible, as God is telling Abraham this, Abram this, does he have any children yet? It'll be a long time before he does, doesn't it? Yeah, but God has promised him he would have a son. They were promised physical descendants. He was given personal blessings. He says, I will bless thee. I'm going to make your name great. In fact, I'm going to even bless those that bless you and those that curse you, I'm going to curse them. These are all physical blessings, earthly blessings. There's a national blessing. I'm going to make of you a great nation. Then there is another physical blessing that has spiritual implications. And these shall all the families of the earth be blessed. It's actually a prop prophecy of the Messiah. But where did the Messiah come? To earth. An earthly blessing. We can look at other passages of Scripture, promises that were made to the children of Israel. Remember there are passages of Scripture that reminded them if they would do certain things, and particularly turn back to God, that God would restore the rain. He would uh, you know, take them to a land flowing with milk and honey. Remember that? The promise of fertile soil, beautiful crops. The promise of being restored if they would turn back to Him. The promise of safety. All those were physical blessings. And here the author of Hebrews is saying, listen, brethren, holy brethren, you're being made partaker not of an earthly calling. Even though that was great, and that was wonderful. Man, God was great, wasn't he? But it's no longer an earthly blessing. We've been promoted. It's now a heavenly calling. A heavenly calling. So their former calling was their earthly calling, but now the present calling. Now, as he's addressing these individuals, holy brethren, that includes not only the Jew, but the Gentile, anyone that accepts Christ as Savior, now we are all, as Christians, Except for Christ the Savior, partakers of not the earthly calling, but a heavenly calling. We've been promoted. Why is it a heavenly calling? Well, it's a heavenly calling because of its origin. 
Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Who has called us? God. It's a heavenly origin or heavenly calling because of its origin. Not only its origin, but its means. How are you and I brought to be children of God? Well, two things at least were involved. The Word of God, the Holy Word of God, and the Holy Spirit of God. It is a heavenly calling. Not only because of its origin, because of its means, but also because of the sphere of our citizenship. When you and I accept Christ as Savior, our citizenship changed. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. For our conversation, Greek word there meaning citizenship, for our citizenship is in where? Heaven. I hadn't been there yet, but I'm going. I am a resident there. I am a citizen there. I have a heavenly calling. It's a heavenly calling because of its origin, because of its means, because of its, uh, our citizenship, but also because of the end to, work, to which we're called. And one of these days, the Lord tarries, you and I will draw our last breath. And when the life here, as we know it, ends, life will not cease. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 8, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. My, it's a heavenly calling. It is a heavenly calling. We have been promoted in the family business. We are in a new partnership. Brand new partnership. We've moved from earthly things to heavenly things. Colossians 3 and verse 2 reminds us, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Why? Because we have a heavenly calling. We're partakers, partners of the heavenly calling. Let me illustrate. If I were to become the partner with Buddy, if he were foolish enough to take me up on that deal, what would you think if I showed up on Monday morning, bright and early, before the crack of dawn, to pour concrete in this suit? What are you laughing at my suit for? I could bring class to the workplace. You see what Buddy wears to work? If it ain't 20 below zeros, he's in short and a short sleeve shirt. I think I ought to wear a suit to my new job. You think that would work very good? No, I can, <laughs> not for me, I can see Buddy now, he, he'd be laughing. He'd be laughing even harder once we got to the job place. Dirt flying everywhere, concrete going everywhere. My suit wouldn't come home clean, would it? Not if I was working. What, what if, what if you've been working at McDonald's? You've been working the cash register and you got your, your nice McDonald's uniform. But then you get a job on base. You, go, you can now move from $8 an hour to $12 an hour or whatever. A big, big, big pay increase. And you go into the job place wearing your McDonald's uniform. Well, I like this. This is my, this is my uniform. But you don't work there anymore. What sense does it make? You've been promoted to better things. Why are we still wearing the old things? You know, as a Christian, we need to understand we are partners of a heavenly calling. We are set our affections on things above, not things on earth. We need to get rid of the old things and move forward with the new things. See, the first thought this morning is that we are partners of the heavenly calling. Then we come down to verse number 14 of the same chapter, for the verse we started with this morning, and we find that we are partners, partakers of Christ. Now, this particular passage of Scripture, as we're, we're looking at just a few verses, 
So the context of Scripture is Hebrews here, he's, he's moving into a different phase of having, showing Christ is better than Moses. And it's particularly relating to the fact that in Christ we find, key word in the passage, rest. Rest. So not only this morning are we partners of the heavenly calling, but number two, we are partners in Christ's rest. In Christ's rest. This morning in Sunday school, we talked about that, didn't we? We talked about being weary. We talked about how we can get you know, depleted physically, emotionally, spiritually. And the Holy Spirit is the one who strengthens us through those times. Here we have an invitation to be partners with Christ, specifically in the context here of Hebrews 3 and 4, partners in his rest. You know what, this afternoon? I had plans this afternoon. I did. They got canceled. You know what? Lord willing, I'm going to take me a nap. I, I, I'll say that and I'll probably go home and be wide awake. And that's, that's okay if it does. But sometimes I just need some rest. We have here, we've been called to be partners of Christ's rest. What, what, what kind of rest is he talking about? Well, the re, word rest is used over and over again. We're going to start over in chapter number four, though. So he deals with this idea of rest, being partners of Christ's rest. Chapter 4, verse 3. He says, For we which have believed do enter into, there's the word, what is it? Rest. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said. Of course, he has a quote there. Notice here, the first rest that we're invited to is the rest of salvation. The rest of salvation. When did this rest begin, does he say here? When we did what? When we believed. He's talking about salvation. Believing in Jesus Christ. Remember Romans chapter 10? Thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Romans 10, 10. You confess with your mouth and believe in your heart the Lord Jesus. This rest begins at salvation. There's many people today that they are working themselves to death thinking they're going to make it to heaven. Because they were at church this morning. Because they went and saw the priest and told him all the things they did bad this week. Because they went and volunteered at the soup kitchen. Because of all the things they think they're doing to earn their way to heaven. There's here, when we believe, we enter into rest. Salvation is a gift. You don't earn gifts. You receive gifts. You see, in the opening illustration this morning, Buddy had already done all the work. I had nothing to contribute to it. Well, how do I enter into this partnership? When I believe. When I believe. When I believe that Jesus Christ is who he says he is, the Son of God. He's the Lord. When I believe that he died for me, was buried and rose again, he died for my sins because the wages of sin is death. And when I turn to him and him alone, knowing I can't earn it, for it's by grace that we're saved through faith, not of works, but that any man should boast. When I turn to him, believing, trusting in him and him alone, praying, that's confessing with the mouth, Jesus, I believe you are who you said you are. I believe you died for my sins. I know I can't get to heaven on my own. There's nothing I can do to earn it. I'm asking you to forgive me my sins and to be my Savior. That is what he's talking about. When you believe and you pray, ask God to save you. For we which have believed do enter into rest. I don't have to work for my salvation. I could work as much as I wanted to, but guess what? I've never earned it. But when I believe, I've entered into the rest of salvation. Not only the rest of salvation... Then there's another rest spoken of in verse number 9. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also ceases from his own works as God did from his. Here, <clears throat> verse number 9 is a different rest. It's a different Greek word. It's a word that's related to the word Sabbath. It's a Sabbath rest. In the Old Testament, what are we supposed to do on the Sabbath day? Rest. This Sabbath day rest is dealing with 
the Sabbath of when we enter heaven. Then when you and I get to heaven, there will be total, complete rest. You know all the troubles you've got here? Guess what? They'll be gone. All the trials you go through here, guess what? They'll be gone. It's the rest of the Sabbath. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. When I enter into glory, whether by the rapture or by dying here physically, when I enter into heaven, I will find the ultimate rest. So there's the rest of salvation, entering to rest by Christ the Savior. The fact that we will enter into rest when we get to heaven, there's, a, in our minds, a big gap in between. What do you do in the meanwhile? Well, that brings us to the third rest found in verse number 11. There's less labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit, under the joints and marrow, and under the sun of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Notice there's the rest in between, the rest between salvation and the rest of the Sabbath entering into heaven. It's interesting, he doesn't say, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. Here we have a picture, remember he's talking to the Jews. He's giving them a picture. Yes, you enter into rest by accepting Christ as Savior. And then yes, there's going to be that great day we get to heaven and you have ultimate rest. But in the meanwhile, do you remember when the children of Israel got to the Jordan River? This is the picture he brings back to mind. Hey, you remember? They entered into the promised land. It was what God promised. Crossing Jordan isn't a picture of going to heaven. It's actually a picture of salvation. We enter into the promised land. When Joshua took the people of Israel to the, into the promised land, to, the, to what we know as Israel today, did they find it as a land flowing of milk and honey? Yeah, they did. God gave it to them, right? Absolutely. But they had to labor, didn't they? They had to drive out the people. There was still a labor involved in the rest that was given. That deals with us living here. We've entered into the promised land, if you will. We've entered into salvation. But between here and heaven, there's some work to do. But we're laboring to enter into that rest. What does that mean? Well, notice here that our present rest is when we depend upon the Spirit. When we depend upon Him, we enter into this inheritance that God has given us. We have some work to do. Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5 is where we find the, other, the only other passage of Scripture that uses this word partake, the same Greek word that we're looking at today in the book of Hebrews. In Luke chapter number 5, we have an account in the life of Jesus concerning his disciples. Luke chapter 5, verse number 1 says this, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, and saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. And when he had left speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said to him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when he had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net brake. And they beckoned unto their, here's the word, unto their what? Partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, <coughs> excuse me, he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. Jesus said to Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. 
And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Here we have the story of Jesus calling the disciples here. We know the story. We read it, how you know, Jesus had taught them. And then he said, tell us, tell us Peter, go out and let down your nets. Which I, know you, I know you fished all night. You don't tell me that. I know you didn't catch anything. Just listen to me. Go out, throw out your nets. Okay, well, I'll throw out my net. We know that story, right? We preached on it. And then this wonderful miracle happens. And they call their partners over. Who are their partners? James and John. So we have Peter, Andrew, James, and John here, all four of them. They're together trying to work together to get all the fish in the boat. As they get fish into the two boats, it's so heavy the boats are almost sinking. They get to shore, and Jesus says, I like the way he puts it in Matthew 4, verse 19, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Hey, guys, you're partners, right? You're working together to accomplish something together, right? Why don't you be my partner? Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. He says we enter into rest, you know, our present rest does have some work. Our primary work is to partner with Christ, have souls saved. This past week on Thursday evening, many of you partnered together for one goal. Men and women, to come in, just have a good time, but to be under the sound of the gospel, to hear God's plan of salvation. So you go, well, you know, I, I didn't do much. Before. I didn't even come. I just dropped off some food. You partner together. Well, you know, I, I, I know a couple of people that got here and the, the church members that didn't feel well and they had to go back home. You know what? You still partner together. You, you shared in the work of Christ. When you came out and, you know, last Sunday evening after church, many of you stayed behind and helped, helped set up. Well, that's all I did. You partnered with Christ for one goal. Many of you stayed behind, and uh, some of the ladies stayed, and they did the decorations such as this, and we had the, the deer heads and the mounts up here, all for one purpose, not to show off our trophies, but for God to win some trophies. For someone to hear the gospel, be, to be convicted by the Holy Spirit of God, and that night pray to Christ as their Savior. We partner together. We partner together with Christ in the work of Christ, and we all came together, at least 15 souls profess to accept Christ as Savior. That is the work we've been called to do, partnering together with Him. You know, as we live this life, there are often difficult circumstances, difficult situations. And, you know, the picture here is of, of the children of Israel going and taking the land. That wasn't an easy job. But notice here, and this labor that we're entered into, there's these three verses I read, 11, 12, and 13. The middle verse is central to our labor. For the word of God is quick and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing into, even to the dividing of soul and spirit, of the joints and the marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God is central in our labor for the Lord here. And that's growing to be who we need to be and sharing the gospel with others. The word of God is central. If we're going to labor together with Christ, there is a walk of faith that is required. This picture of the nation of Israel. So how do you know it's the nation of Israel? Because we talk about those who you know, did not go because of unbelief. In Joshua chapter 1 and verse 3, this walk of faith being required is illustrated for us. When the Lord speaks to Joshua and says this, Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given you, as I said unto Moses. It required a walk. Joshua could have claimed the promise, God's given all of it to me. Yeah, isn't it great? This is awesome. It's all mine. He said, wherever I walk, it's mine. This is awesome. There was a requirement, wasn't there? Wherever the sole of your foot treads. Joshua, if you want it, you've got to go get it. Joshua, you want to go over there? 
across the river. Joshua, you want that city? Go take it. It's yours. It requires a walk of faith. A walk of faith. Our present rest in claiming the inheritance that God gave us. So we see this morning that in the partnering touch of, of the Master, we see that we're partners of a heavenly calling. We're partners in Christ's rest. We can also notice, remember the Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 3, we find that in this partnership, we are to participate with the Holy Spirit. We are to participate with the Holy Spirit. Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 4. Notice the last phrase. Made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Partakers of the Holy Ghost. We're partners. When an individual accepts Christ as Savior, we showed this a couple weeks ago in Sunday school, when a person accepts Christ as Savior, immediately the Holy Spirit comes to live within them. The Holy Spirit is the one by which we live the Christian life. If we're going to live the Christian life, guess what? We have to participate with Him. We are partners together. What if Buddy and I partner up together? And he's out there, and he's, he's helped there, Roger, and they're, 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 they're shoveling, they're, they're digging the the little trenches and everything, and y'all doing good. You know what? I think I'm going to church and do some work. Or what if Buddy and Roger are down there and there, and I'm over here, and then Buddy and Roger are like, Buddy's a pretty patient man. I don't know how long he's going to be patient with that, though. Every shovel they dig, I throw one in. What are we going to accomplish together? Nothing. You see, for us to be partners, in, that means we have to work together, doesn't it? If I'm a partner with Buddy, he probably could be, Pastor, go to the store and get snacks. As soon as I drive, I leave out, hey, Roger, let's get to work. We'll get something done now. See, for something to get done, we have to work together. If the Spirit is leading me this direction, the Spirit reminds me to hold my tongue. But I go, I ain't listening to you or anybody. And I'm going to tell them what I think. Guess what? Did I partner with the Spirit? No. He said, go this direction. And I said, ain't doing. I'm going this way. What have I accomplished? What has the Spirit accomplished in me? Nothing, because I didn't partner with him. I didn't participate with him. I went against what he told me. I must participate with him. Remember our opening text, Hebrews chapter 3. That was verse 14 and 15. It's going to remember, and he's using the illustration of the children of Israel having gotten to the promised land, entering into rest. You know, remember that story, okay? He says, we are partakers of Christ, if or since we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast until the end. While it is said, and he's quoting, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Remember? He's quoting here, he's reminding us, if you want to enter into the rest, that means you have to participate, you have to move forward. Don't be... Like that day when they got to the Jordan River, they listened to the ten spies. And they hardened their hearts. They didn't believe. What were the consequences of that? 38 more years, total of 40, wandering in the wilderness, dying off. Listen. Participate with the Spirit. Don't work against Him. Work with Him. Don't harden your heart. Follow him. Participate with him because he convicts us. In John chapter 16, verse 8, and when he, that's the Spirit, the Comforter, when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will reprove or convict the word of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Listen, when the Holy Spirit of God brings conviction on your life, do something about it. Don't do this. 
You ready? Invitation comes. I ain't moving. I know I should, but I ain't moving. The Spirit brings conviction. Are we participating with Him? Are we standing firm on sinking sand? The Spirit brings conviction. Don't sit and let the devil play games with you. But what are they going to think? Who cares what they think? They don't know what's in your heart. What matters is what does God think? If there's conviction, then get right with God. Take care of business. He is helping you. He's leading you away. He's keeping you away from the pit. He's keeping you away from the end that you don't want. He's trying to lead you in a better direction to get what you really desire. He brings conviction. He also searches us. The psalmist said this. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows our hearts. He knows our intents. Allow him to search. And when he, what he finds, deal with. You see, as he convicts and he, as he searches, we must respond. We must respond. James chapter 1, verses 22 through 27. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if, a man, for if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Picture of a mirror, man looking in a mirror. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. When you got up in the morning, got up this morning, did you look in the mirror? We probably all did. I doubt anybody got up and go, oh, I'm good. Uh, what do we look in the mirror? Let's see what needs to be taken care of, right? Bedhead, drool, whatever it may have been. We look in there to see what was wrong so we could fix it. Notice the picture. It continues, verse number 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, phrase referring to the word of God, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious, and brighteth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, Notice the last phrase, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. When the Spirit convicts, and we come face to face with the issue, the problem, with something in our lives we need to get right with God, it says the person that looks at the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, in other words, responds accordingly. You see where you woke up this morning and the drool was running down your face. You responded accordingly. You went and got a washcloth and washed your face. When you continued in it, that's when it benefited you. Looking at it didn't make a difference. It just brought attention to the problem. But now what are we going to do about it? You continue therein so that we are unspotted from the world. We must participate with the Holy Spirit. You know, the lower an object is lowered, into the water, the greater the pressure. You know that, you know, the, further, the deeper you go in the water, the greater the pressure. A boat that sinks in deep water can be very easily crushed and torn apart. But there is a boat that is designed to withstand those pressures. It's called a submarine. You know that? Yeah, that submarine is built so that the pressure inside matches or exceeds the pressure on the outside. So the pressure going in that would crush it doesn't. It's pressurized. The Holy Spirit of God is the one who pressurizes our life. When we yield to him, we find that the pressure of this world 
no longer have effect. But unfortunately, there's many Christians who fail to, uh, to participate with the Holy Spirit of God, and the pressures of the world are crushing them because they haven't allowed the Holy Spirit to work in their lives, to participate with Him. And they, we go out into a world unprepared, and we're crushed by the pressure of the world. As being partakers of Christ, we must participate with the Spirit. And then lastly this morning, look over a few chapters to chapter 12 of Hebrews. As we are partakers this morning, the partnering touch of, of the Master, we're reminded that we are partners of the Holy Calling. We are partners in Christ's rest. We should participate with the Holy Spirit. But then, in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse Six. Begin reading there. It says, For whom the Lord loveth, this is a pleasant thought, he chasteneth, he disciplines, and scourges every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chast- chastisement, whereof all are There's the word, partakers. All Christians are partakers in the chastisement of the Lord. He says, but if ye be without chastisement, then ye are bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily, for a few days, chastened us after their own pleasure. But he, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Let us forth that we are partakers of God's discipline. We are saved by the grace of God this morning. God disciplines his own children. That's the point there. If God's disciplining you, praise God for it. That means you're his. If he's not, be worried. You are not his. Now, chastening is not pleasant, as it says, but it's for our benefit. He makes the analogy here of, of, of physical fathers, our fathers, who maybe disciplined us when we were growing up for a short time. But God disciplines us for our good and for his glory. Notice it is for our good because he says here in the verse 10, but for our profit. Our profit. He disciplines us. He guides us. He leads us. He directs us for our own good. Not for pleasure. He never disciplines us incorrectly, for the wrong reasons, for the wrong motives. It's always for our good. Not only is it for our good, but it's also for his glory, that we might be partakers of his holiness. This morning, if God's disciplining you, number one, take action, get things right. Number two, praise God for it. That means you're his evidence that you're his. This morning we are partakers of Christ. We've been made partners in the family business. If you accept Christ as your Savior this morning, you're partakers, partners with him. A wealthy man passed away leaving behind a very wealthy estate, but he had no heirs to leave it to. He had had one son, and that son had had passed away before the father did. And within the will of this wealthy man, he was, had his explicit instructions that they were to auction off a lot of the artwork that he had. He had a very expensive art collection. The day of the auction came, and many people from around the world had showed up to hopefully get a, a piece of this, this great collection. The auctioneer arrived, and the very first piece of artwork displayed to be sold was actually a piece of art that the deceased man's son had done as a child. It wasn't, wasn't anything great. It wasn't miraculous. It wasn't 
some great art, piece of artwork. It was just something that his son had, had done. And, of course, the auctioneer got up and tried to get some bids, and no one was interested. They would just kind of wait for the auction to move on to get to the good stuff. Well, as the auctioneer was trying to draw out some bids, uh, a man in the back comes forward and digs in his pockets and looks at the check of money he's got. And he only had a couple of dollars. But the man was a butler, the one who was served the deceased man and his son. Didn't mean much to anybody else, and he didn't have a lot of money, and of course now he was unemployed. But he thought, well, if I can get just a little bit of memorabilia, he showed the man like two, three dollars. Auctioner asked for some more bids, nobody bid. The gavel went down, sold! That butler had bought that little piece of artwork from the son that he had helped to raise for a time. Audience starts to get a little noisy. Everybody's getting anxious. The auctioner steps up and says, the auction's over. Everybody's puzzled. You see, the man had left explicit instructions in the wheel. The first piece to be auctioned was the auction of his son's work. Now, whoever was interested enough in his son's work Got all the blessings of the Father. This morning, if you accept Christ as your Savior, you trusted Him, Him alone, not only did you get the blessing of Christ, you can be partakers of all the Father's blessings. You are partners. You and I are partners with God. This morning, let me encourage you. Let the Holy Spirit do an evaluation. Are we assets or liabilities? We've been given a great privilege in being partners. Let's make sure we're doing our part while we're here and honoring the name that we have, Christian. Let's pray.